Hi, everyone. This is Mike with episode 25 of Getting Everyone Moving, brought to you by Palms to Pines Parasports. Today, we have another Paralympian, Rose Holloman. Hey, Rose. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. So let's start off by talking about how you got involved, uh, you know, in the world of adaptive sports. Um, well, I was in a car accident when I was five in 2001. And off of that injury, they kind of for rehab started having me do therapy at different locations throughout Minnesota. And one of them ended up being swim therapy at a uh, Curd Center. And my therapist just knew of the basketball program and the swimming program. And she encouraged me to get started. And once I like got into one sport, I just started all of the sports. <laughs> wow. And I, you know, I, I read a little bit about you and I know, uh, that accident was a real family tragedy. Um, I think you lost a couple of brothers, um, mm -hmm. really hard. I mean, how, how did your family kind of, you know, move on from that? What, what kinds of things did you all do? Um, I guess I was so young that I didn't really initially realize the impact that it had. I just, all of a sudden two people that I were cared for so much weren't there anymore. I think, actually sports were really therapeutical for my entire family, not only for myself, because I also was, I came out of it with an injury. So I think I was kind of a symbol of the, the, the tragedy that had happened. And then my mom being able to bring me to therapies and to sports and kind of seeing me excel and succeed was very healing for myself and for her. Right. Now you, I mean, you grew up in a a fairly small town area. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, how did you, how did you find, you know, did you have to travel far to play? I mean, what did you do? <laughs> yeah. My mom and dad are, are crazy and they would drive 90 miles both ways to bring me to practices like five to six days a week. They were just, and I mean that it was a long drive for us, but I think I've gotten so much out of it. I'm so grateful that they were willing to do that. And even on the days when they didn't have to bring me up to practices, they would still bring me to the gym and rebound for me and help me lift and do all those other things. They were my like little personal coaches all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, in my, in my experience in coaching youth in wheelchair basketball, I mean, I found people driving that far. I mean, they drive two hours, mm -hmm. three hours each way. And, you know, I was just amazed by you know, this dedication, this wanting to play, but it made such a difference in academically, you know, for, for the kids and, and all that. I mean, did you find that as well? We, did you focus more? Or... Yeah. Uh, I actually don't think the, I was always not as interested when I, growing up, when I was younger, I wasn't as interested in, in academics as I probably should have been, but it was basketball that ended up being the thing that kind of sparked my interest in it. When I got to college, just my first year, I didn't do as well as I had hoped. And it kind of was because I was in the back, like on the court all the time. And once that happened, it helped me turn around my academics. And once I started studying a little bit more, I ended up falling in love with learning and teaching academics. So I guess later on in life, it definitely was the thing that sparked my academic enthusiasm. Okay, all right, we're gonna talk more about that. But, you know, beside your parents, um, who else have been supports, uh, you know, in your life? And I want you also to talk about, you know, what drives you? Because I know, I mean, you're one of the best basketball players in the world, women's basketball players. I mean, how, what, where does that come from? Um, I think initially for a long time, it did come from the fact that I lost two of my brothers, just kind of that I was given this opportunity to strive forward and motivate and to work. That was something that really pushed me. I also am just someone that really, really loves basketball. So that always motivated me that I just love the game so much. And then here recently, uh, so my brother's first child, they named after my brothers that died. So I have three brothers and two of them passed away and the oldest named his son after them. So I think him, he became kind of my biggest motivation, especially uh, two years ago, he was diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma cancer and just seeing him fight through that. And like, there's not a day that goes by that he's not smiling and giggling and just like embodying strength at the highest capacity that he motivates me more than anything in the world right now. And his little, he has a little niece 
who's also motivating because she's so darn cute. <laughs> so what what other tell me their names? I need to know. Uh so the boy is Ethan Shane, which are my brothers. And then the girl, yeah, is Madeline Rose. <laughs> That's great. And do they live close to you? Are you able to see them at all? Or? Um, well, I live in Spain, but when I go home, I get to see them. They live extremely close to grandma and grandpa. Okay. That's right. So you're playing in Spain now? Yeah, I live and play in the Canary Islands. Oh my gosh. I mean, what? <laughs> you know, I, I know, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have professional, you know, wheelchair basketball in the States yet. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of the players do go overseas. So what is that like to be living, you know, overseas and playing and, you know, actually, I mean, being paid, right? There's a, a league. Yeah. And all, how... how yeah, how does that feel? It's awesome. It's probably one of my biggest dreams coming true is being able to just train all the time constantly. And just in college, you get to train all the time, but you have this other level of professionalism here that just makes it so like every day is just focused on basketball, trying to get better, eating habits, sleeping habits, just everything is all consumed by it. And it's a lot of fun. The team I play on, like we all get along really well. It's super international. So play with like an Irish player, a Dutch player, a South African player, a Venezuelan player, uh, like Spanish players, of course, and another American. So it's fun to kind of have that diversity and learn from different people. Will you be playing against some of your teammates in the Paralympics then? Um, well, it's actually pretty much strictly male-based. Okay, so you're playing with men then? Yeah, I'm playing because with the classification system in wheelchair basketball, yeah, I, I go down a point and a half. So I'm playing with just men basically. Yeah. Wait, so what's your classification then? So in women's, I'm a 3-5 and then in men's, I'm a 2-0. That's not fair, Rose, come on. <laughs> That's so unfair, oh my gosh. <laughs> That's good for you, though. You know, I I was talking to Ron Likens, and you know, I, I was asking him about, well, you know, why isn't there professional wheelchair basketball in the states? And I kind of equated it to, you know, the women uh, NBA and having to go overseas, you know, to to make a decent amount of money, right? I mean, what mm. what is it going to take to do you think to get professional, you know, wheelchair basketball in the U.S.? Um, uh, I don't know. The yeah. thing with the U.S. that makes it so difficult is travel is so expensive. Yeah. So, because I, I know for a fact our team, we're a team that has a fair amount of money, but it most of it is spent on traveling because I live on a set of islands off the coast of Morocco. So we have to fly to almost all of our games. And just like in the States, it's the same thing. You'd have to fly to everything. You couldn't get on buses and it'd be a comfortable ride. So I just, the funding really has to be there for it to happen in the States. And I don't know if it has to be us attaching ourselves more to the NBA or if it, yeah. I'd, I'd also think that the Paralympic movement in other countries is maybe further along than within the States. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's impacting it. Okay. How many teams are there playing overseas then? Or how many teams do you compete with? Uh, so we compete with in a league that has 12 teams. Wow. And it's, are there other women playing too? Yeah, there's, I would say every team has like one to two females on it, depending on like court time differs, but like the top four or five teams all get a girl on half the time. So that's nice to see. You know, amazing. So you've been able to travel, you know, through being professional wheelchair basketball player. I mean, what, you know, and, and playing sport always leads to learning a lot of life lessons. Um, mm -hmm. What have been some of those lessons for you that, you know, you're, you're not only learning now, but you'll take um, with you you know, with your career, I mean, after basketball, if there is an after basketball, who knows, <laughs> <laughs> you'll keep playing forever. <gasps> yeah, I wish. Uh, I, I guess 
the biggest thing in a team sport is definitely working with other people and just kind of like really focusing on getting the most out of everyone around you. And I also think work ethic is something that just naturally gets taught to you that you kind of overlook. It's just how hardworking you have to be as an athlete. Yeah. And t- so let, let's talk a little bit about your uh, progression, you know, to being um, an elite athlete. So you're in an accident at five and then how, you know, talk about, you know, your life all the way up to going to college. Um, so accident at five, I probably, I got started in basketball at seven and kind of the time in between was like rehab and still staying pretty active. And then at seven, I was like from seven to 12, I was doing swimming, archery, taekwondo, uh, basketball, sled hockey, tennis, track. It was just like any sport that they had to offer, my mom was making me do or having me do. I think I wanted to, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) uh, And then at 12, I kind of started to get more serious about basketball and I made like the varsity team at the uh, the Minnesota Junior Rolling Timberwolves and then kind of had Dan Price who went on to coach USA national team and GB national team as kind of a mentor for me. And I also had like Ben Kenyon that would go to the gym with me extra and it just kind of gradually like led up to me going to Australia in 2009 when I was really young with a group of under 20, um, uh, under 20 men's team. And then in 2011, fell into going to a tryout and ended up making that team and then just kind of kept running with it until I went to college and even now. (laughs) So you've been in a a few Paralympics. Uh, The last one, you won gold. Um, You know, I've seen, obviously seen pictures of the team and you and your excitement. I mean, can you describe that feeling? What What is it like to compete against the world's best, you know, and then, I mean, be the best in the world? Um, I got blissful and unbelievable. It, it was like a, a moment of like peacefulness, but also just kind of so surreal that it was unbelievable that it actually happened. I think like in all the pictures, you see all the excitement, but what you don't see is when we all head back into the locker room and we're all sitting there just crying by ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, and that, that was the moment when you realize that all the dedication and hard work and stuff you put into it actually turned into something that was a goal. It was, I I mean, some athletes never get to have that moment and to get to is just unbelievable. What do you mean? Interesting that you say the word peacefulness. I mean, what do you, what do you mean by that? Hmm. I guess just like that, like you did it. It's Paralympics have this weird, atmosphere to it in general where like you it's four years of thinking about one thing and you're you're leading up to it you're working it for it you're sacrificing for it it's like this one moment that you're waiting for and when you get to that you have this like you did it you were successful it's over this team got to go out the way you wanted it to we got this moment together it's just like this, you know, it's this short period of time where you get to feel successful, but you also aren't thinking about the next games. You just like, it's a. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, that must be an incredible feeling. Wow. Um, so you've been really fortunate too. I mean, you attended University of Texas, um, Arlington, um, you know, which is one of the few collegiate adaptive athletic programs in the country. Um mm-hmm. You know, what, what was it like to play um, at the University of Texas and, you know, being with your teammates and just the push that you all made, you know, to become, again, the best, you know, in women's collegiate, you know, basketball? Um, well, that, lucky enough on that, like, very fortunate with UTA, the fact that it was a very new program. So the program had only been around for one year when we had gotten there. And the, my freshman year, there was one returning athlete and then there was only six of us on the team. So we were a very small program. We were really fighting to get, I mean, it it really embodied a sense of like 
female empowerment in me. Like we were fighting for, for scholarships for us. We were fighting for court time for us, for travel funds for us. We were just always fighting for everything so that we could feel like the, the women's team was getting the same as the men's team. And the whole entire process, it was that the, the first year in terms of basketball on and off the court, we were, we just struggled. It was, you know, the core six of us, Josie included in this, that just kind of struggled. It, we were all freshmen. We didn't know what we were doing. Freshman years is not fun anyways, let alone if you're right. surrounded by other freshmen. Right. <laughs> and then I think like that next year, we really like funding really went up. A lot of girls came to our team. We started seeing things be really turn around for us. And then uh, we ended up winning that year, which I think is one of my higher up their accomplishments just from you know starting from the ground up and building something and really feeling like it's yours and then also I think like the biggest success came when Jason Nelms ended up becoming a full-time coach and getting paid for that I think that's it that was a huge accomplishment for our program so you I mean, through this experience, you've become a real advocate too. I mean, I would say probably that's one of the things that you've that you've learned or maybe been pushed into doing. I mean, do you feel that way that that you need to, you know, continue just to advocate for? Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think like one being disabled athlete, we always have to advocate for ourselves. A disabled person or I always have to advocate for myself. Being a female athlete, I always have to advocate for myself, especially wheelchair basketball is awesome because there's a classification system and like just the format of it, it's so inclusive that men and women are always playing together. And I think so then there's a core group of us that are embodied with a sense of like female empowerment. And that's something that we always, I mean, every time you get on a court, you have to have that chip on your shoulder. I think that's really important. and. I also believe that the guys that play the sport are activists for us as well. That's something that coming over here, I've been so impressed with is that like I'm playing with and against 95% of people around me are guys and the amount of support and just kind of like motivation and accountability that they hold to me is really awesome to see them also kind of advocating for me as a female. Uh. I, I still don't think it's fair that you're a 2-0 playing against them. I mean, my gosh, Rose, come on. <laughs> um, let, let's talk a little bit about collegiate programs um, because one of the things that I'm really trying to push uh, at Palms of Pines is getting more you know, collegiate adaptive sports. And I just, you know, no matter how you look at it, it's still just a handful of programs in the US. You know, in, in mm -hmm. Canada, there's, not really much at all, if anything. Um, how, how do we, I mean, get more collegiate, you know, level adaptive sports? Um, it's so hard. It's kind of the same, like university stepping up and saying that they want to be a part of it. It's just somewhere along the Paralympic movement have to start encouraging like universities and programs to kind of step in and put aside funding for disabled sports I it's hard I mean even like you you bring up Canada and look at the rest of the world I can't name another university that has an adaptive sports program with anywhere else in the world outside of the U.S. and within the U.S. we struggle so much with it already that I it's just about like us as athletes like always advocating and trying to get more I get, social media is a great platform for individuals yeah. to try to bring attention to this stuff. And I think we have a group of athletes that are really trying to do that. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about policy. You know, the U.S., of course, American with Disabilities Act. Um, I spent mm -hmm. seven years overseas uh, working in the field of disability and came back. And when I came back in 2016, I thought things are just perfect here, you know, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's not. So what are, what are some other policies or um, programs, you know, that need to be put in place? I mean, in the U.S. to really, and I'm thinking more about creating, you know, more inclusion or creating more accessibility. Hmm. Well, I agree with you that the, the U.S. is pretty remarkable in terms of accessibility. And it, yeah, I, I 
I think like rehabilitation centers can do a better job of like incorporating a program that can evaluate individuals and then turn them towards a sports program. Like I really think that there has to be some sort of like hospitals and sports programs have to become more linked. So, cause the, what we're always saying is there's not enough athletes, there's not enough, but there's so many disabled people in the world that like could be benefiting from this. And granted, not everyone's into sports, but in some way or another, they can be put onto some sort of sport. I think that has to be a link we have to create. Also like the school systems have to do, I think like incorporating just a short unit about the Paralympics and sixth grade health, for example, or anything is I'm a elementary teaching major. So that was something that like, I would always incorporate like Paralympic week into the classroom or, and I think that would go a really, really long ways to start like breaking down stigmas that we have in the U S with disabled sports. Cause yeah. go ahead. Uh, like I, I think like we've made things so accessible and we've put in so many programs that we haven't broken down those barriers, which are really important, breaking down like the way that we perceive disability within the States. Yeah. Have you seen the movie Crip Camp? Uh, no, I haven't, Not but yet. I keep like thinking I need to watch it. <laughs> you need to watch it. Um, cause it's really amazing. Um, you know, Ron Lycan said something interesting to me. He said, you know, the, some of the athletes now, you know, find it, they don't know the history of how they got to where they're at now, you know, and I think Crip Camp, uh, I mean, it really shows that, you know, with Judy Human and, and others. So, okay. Recommend it. You should, you should check <laughs> okay. it out. Um, so your career, um, you know, obviously you'll continue playing basketball. I would expect that you'll be coaching at some point as well, if you're not already. Um, what, what are you, yeah, what are you doing? What do you want to do for a career? Um, like after basketball or during basketball? Well, you know, between now, if you look back on your life, let's say 10 years from now, right? What are you doing? Um, I actually find a lot of, I think being over here playing sports and trying to advocate is something that's really meaningful to me that I would like to, I've, this is my second season abroad. I would like to spend, you know, maybe five, six years over here playing and, you know, continuing to kind of advocate for women and disabilities over here. And then, I mean, I would like to at some point move back to the States and get a normal teaching job. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so we're coming towards the end of our interview. Um, what are some final words, you know, that you'd like to, to leave us with um, about, you know, playing sport, about life? I mean, whatever you'd like to say. Um, I always say this for basketball. Like uh, one of the favorite, my favorite things a coach has said to me is uh, like, remember first and last that it's a game and you have to love what you're doing. Doesn't mean you have to work really hard. It just means that you have to love your trade. And you do. Yeah, I love it. You love basketball. Yeah, I, I share that, your love for basketball. I just, you know, I hope I can play forever. And it's really interesting because my parents are 92 and 88 and they watch every Lakers game. Really? Without fail. Um, you know, and that, I mean, I, I guess my, especially my dad instilled that in me, you know, it, it's just everything about the game is so wonderful. And, you know, it's great to watch you obviously play and, and your teammates. And um, I hope you'll play for a long, long time. I hope so too. <laughs> great. Thank you. So I love much. that. About your parents. Yeah. Thank you.